Okay, so thank you very much, um, Alena, for uh, inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, this is a joint work with many colleagues. I will um, cite them during the talk, and we have some sponsors which are here in this first page. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some work I did on using optimization and control to address some issues in controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, I will start talking a little bit about the compartmental model that I am assuming that you know a little bit about it. And then I'll show how we can use optimal control and optimization to, um, to deal with some questions about it and how we can model the ICU demand, which is important in our model. And I will present some case studies on how this um, theory can be applied to real problems. So let's start with the compartmental models. But before that, um, since um, the name of your group is AR for pandemic, I decided to explain why are we using optimization. So in some sense, I would say that uh, when you use optimization is, is that is when you have a clear mathematical model and hopefully good data and also enough structure so you can use mathematical optimization which is a series of techniques from mathematics that you can use to find maximum and minimum of um, function subject to functional constraints if you have only a clear mathematical model and reasonable data, but not enough structure, usually you have to, to resort to heuristics. And if you cannot really have a good model of your problem, and um, in this case, you can only resort to some kind of AI technique that you actually extract information from the kind of data that you have that is less structured. In our case, we assume that we have a, a, a good model, which were the compartmental models in epi uh, mathematical epi epidemiology. And those are very simple models that are able to capture um, the dynamics of infectious disease. The basic idea is to group population in disease stages, what we call compartments. And the dynamic is given by the rate of movement between one stage to the next one, in some sense. And two compartments will interact if their input or output depends on the population on those two compartments. The most um, simple um, compartment, compartment, compartmental model is the SIR model, which is the susceptible infectious recovered compartments. In this case, you have a susceptible population that is um, where uh, uh, the disease is spreading. And then depending on the, the ratio in the population of, of infected people and some parameters, uh, you, you have um, that the susceptible population can get sick, then you move to the infectious group. If you remain that for a certain amount of time, which is the mean time of the person keeps spreading the disease uh, in the infectious group here, is not that the person is sick, but it, the, the person is actually uh, is spreading the disease at that moment. If the person is still sick, but it's not spreading anymore, it should not be in the infectious group. And then after a certain amount of time, it will move to a recovered state. And you have some parameters that control um, how easy it is to get infected and how fast you move from infectious to recovery, which is this beta and gamma parameters here. Well, I usually prefer to work with the basal reproducible number, the R0 and the mean time of infection. And those parameters, they can um, be derived from the beta and the gamma using some formulas. And usually also it's very nice to normalize the population. So you actually assume that instead of having um, actual numbers of persons that are infected in each of the states, you actually assume that you have proportions of the population. So if S is 0.9, you're saying that 90% of your population is susceptible. And if I is 0.01, you're saying that 1% of your population is infectious in that moment, okay? So using this um, notation, you can write down the, um, the dynamics using a differential equation, which is a mean field differential equation. And you are basically assuming um, 
um, some behavior or how this disease spreads. And in this case, this is reasonable for the COVID-19 um, um, disease, okay? So for example, the, the amount of, of people that move from susceptible to infected is proportional to the number of susceptible people you have times the proportion of infected, the probability that you, you find infected people among your contacts, okay? And then you have um, this um, dynamics where people get into infected and live to recover, usually um, taking into account the mean time the person remains infected. Okay, so depending on your disease, you can actually improve those kind of models. For example, in the case of COVID-19, it was very usual to um, have an extra compartment that they call exposed which is someone who already got the disease, but is not in the infectious phase yet. And this is important to understand, to better understand the dynamics of infection. So we usually have this extra um, compartment here, but you can actually have many compartments to, to deal with different um, situations. For example, you can have groups of compartments representing different subpopulations, like example, age groups or things like that. And really depends on what what, what kind of dynamics is important to you and what you are trying to capture, okay? So for example, one of our idea was to model how the disease would spread among the state, the state of Sao Paulo or even the country or in Brazil. So Sao Paulo is basically the most populous state. This is the map of Sao Paulo and it has a very big city here, which is called um, Sao Paulo city. And it actually have many local hubs uh, um, uh, around the state. So this, in this picture, the lines that are connecting um, the different cities are basically, um, they have a color code that shows the amount of, of interchange of people, how many people travel from one city to the, to the other uh, for in any, in a week, and the, the mean in a week in this case. So you see that, Many people come here to Sao Paulo, not, not actually here because I, I'm actually here in Campinas, but many people go to Sao Paulo to work usually during the day and go back um, during the night. And by doing this um, kind of travel, you can see that the, the disease will spread around um, the state, starting usually in Sao Paulo where you have the main airports and where people from abroad arrive usually to work or to, to, to do some tourism, usually work in Sao Paulo. So in this case, what is natural for you is to um, consider that you have many, one for each region populations. So we have like an SEIR model for K regions, okay? And we are trying to model what would happen if you assume that part of this population would move from one of the regions to the other, for example, to work during the day and would come back during the night. And we want to see if this kind of simple model can capture the, the spreading of the disease in the geographical sense, okay? So in order to do that, what you basically have to do, you have to show how those populations interact. And to do this, you, you need this kind of information, how many trips you have every day uh, between those populations. And once you have it, you can actually rewrite your differential equation by showing how those um, populations interact so here the SIJ, for example, is the number of susceptible people that live in the city I, but go to the city, to the region J to work during the day and then they come back during the night, okay? So if you do this and you do it carefully, you can actually write a, a big system, which will result in a big or generic differential equation with many copies of those um, variables. And if you solve um, this ordinary differential equation, you can actually have an idea of how fast the, the, the disease will spread around um, the, the state, okay? And as I said, this kind of models, they are very, very um, flexible. So you can actually add extra compartments to represent different states. For example, you can add a different model or different compartment that 
I represent people that are in quarantine. So they were infected, but they tested positive and then they moved to quarantine. So they don't spread the disease anymore, for example. This is something we did with some colleagues here, part of Anonato, Pichotto Pereira, Sagachizabo, and Struchner. And you can also, for example, model what we would have if you had like a two dose um, vaccination campaign. So you have people in the first group here who are, who are unvaccinated. And then once they get vaccinated, they move to a sec second group of SEIR um, population, which is once vaccinated. And then after the second dose, they move to a third group. And by working out the details, you can actually um, predict what, what, what is going to happen depending on how many um, vaccines you apply every day and things like that. Okay, so how can you use optimization in those models? So the key here is that you have usually an ordinary differential equation, maybe with many um, sub-compartment groups, but you have an ordinary differential equation that, that explains how the disease spreads along those compartments, the S, E, I, R, and Q now, because we have the quarantine states. And you have to um, find some control variables. So what are the control variables? So those are parameters that you can actually control. You can actually change from the ordinary differential equations. In our case, depending on the application, they would be the R, um, the rep reproducible number itself. So when you say that you want to do social distancing, what you're trying to control, you're trying to decrease the, 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 the the reproducible number, the number of people that get infected by for each uh, sick person. Okay, you decrease the movement in the in the society. You can actually decrease. You can actually control in some sense this this variable. And the number of testing you do, for example, the more testing, the more people will go to the quarantine state. So the the number of people that will move to the quarantine state is a function of the number of testing, and you have to to model that. And for example, the number of vaccines you give to your, in your population that will make them move from those unvaccinated states towards the fully vaccinated states. So those are things that you have to choose every single day or every step size, step time, time step in your solution of your differential equations. So you, you have the X variable, which are the state and the U variables, which are the controls they must satisfy together um, ordinary differential equation. You can write this ordinary differential equation in a generic format looking like this, and you can actually approximate this ordinary differential equation, use some kind of discretization of derivatives. So here we, we, are, use, we are using central differences. You can use anything you want. And if you write, um, if you discretize a problem and you write this approximated differential equation, which is now a difference equation, you can actually solve this in a computer, okay? And, and at the end of the day, the differential equation, they will, they will look a little bit like this, okay? Which is something that say how the state evolved in time uh, using as a function of the previous states and the controls you're applying. You have to, in some sense, um, estimate your initial states, and you can actually have uh, other constraints in your problem that say things like the number of people who have to fit in your intensive care capacity, for example. And this is an optimization problem for up to this point, we only have a feasibility problem. And this becomes an optimization problem when you add to this, um, to this problem an objective, which is a function that say, which is a preferable state. For example, you can add an objective that says that you don't want to change too much um, the, the, rep the reproduction number, because if you change it too much, you're asking the people to stay at home for too long. For example, not go to work, or you, you are disrupting the economic, the, the economy, and things like that. So you want to to not to avoid decreasing R too much, and to do that, you, for example, you have to pay by doing more testing and doing better vaccination. Okay, 
So one of the quick questions that we had here is how we can model the, the ICU demand. And we decided to do this using a time series. So what our model basically tries to do, our code basically tries to do is try to maintain the economy as open as possible while presenting the collapse of the health system. And we are using the word collapse here to, to mean the saturation or to, to have more demand for ICU than, to, than we actually have capacity for. We are assuming that the capacity is known in the present and maybe can change in the future, but we can predict how, how this capacity is going to change in the future. And, but you don't know anything, about, you don't know lots about the demand because you cannot control the demand. The demand is the number of sick people. So what you can say is that the higher the number of factions, the higher, the higher the number of people that get sick, the higher will be your CO demand. And what we have decided to do, we decided to using the, the, the past information to compute the proportion of the infected that would actually need intensive care at a given time T. And if you, you are able to compute this proportion, you can actually predict the future if this proportion does not change too fast in time by using the same proportion for the future. And you are basically saying that um, the number of people that get into, um, into your intensive care unit is uh, it's below capacity. The L here is the mean time that the person stays in the, in the ICU, in the intensive care unit, okay? So this would be what we call a deterministic model. So we, we would need to be able to really compute this um, proportion, this rho of t, but this is actually a random variable. So ideally what we want to do is something like we want to model a constraint that say that the probability that um, your random um, process will remain in capacity is at least a given probability that you, you give, like, like 95%, 90% or something like that. Because you cannot really be sure because since rho of t is a random variable. And how you estimate rho, rho of t, you, you can actually compute it from the previous data that you had before. And we use it a time series, uh, 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 time series to do this. And in this time series, we're assuming basically that the, the formula is something that is depend on the past plus a random error, which is assumed to be normal with um, uh, estimated variance that you have, okay? Once you do that, you can actually um, do your math and estimate uh, from this, this assumption that the, the, the noise in the time series is normal, you can actually estimate um, the distribution of the time series itself. So you can write that probabilistic constraint, but we, in, in optimization, we call a chance constraint that basically says that among 90% or 95% of the realization of your random variable, um, the number of people that would need um, intensive care uh, units will remain in your capacity. So here is just a simulation to show that uh, in our simulation, we need to, 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 to have as a goal to, to, to keep the number of infected below this um, blue line. This is the mean of, of your expected um, process. Such in, so that in 90% of the realizations, you don't exceed this, um, the capacity, which is here um, described by this um, straight horizontal line. So only a few realizations of possible future um, realizations of your, of your process, of your random process, you, you will get above your, your capacity, okay? So once we had that, what we had to do was to write the models, to write the code to discretize the model, to write the code to optimize this, this problem, so that a code that would solve the ODE with the constraints, for example, the ICU capacity constraints, and 
at the same time would try to um, find what is your target R of t, your reproduction number that you accept at time t, that will make your, the evolution of your differential equation to, to ensure that you don't exceed the number of ICU units, okay? And since we also have that idea that you, you have many regions, we decided to play a little bit with this, um, with this objective function so that it not only wants to keep the society as open as possible, but would also want to try to make um, different regions close at different times. So you have part of your population, part of your society being able to go out to work while the other part of the society, the other regions are closed at, at that time. So for example, you have two regions that have, um, that work basically in the same kind of economic, uh, um, they do the same kind of work. So one of them would be open and that would, the other one would be closed, something like that. So we, you, once we do that, and you, to do this, you have to identify your control variables, you have to identify what are your constraints, especially the, you have to model your, your, your ICU constraint. Uh, you have to write the code, you use it, we use it, a library in Julia called Jump, and then use an optimization solver to solve your model. And you also have to estimate the initial conditions of your ordinary differential equation, which is something that we can nicely do because once you have everything as an optimization problem, you can actually find the initial conditions using the optimization problem itself. It's like a bootstrapping thing, okay? So, so but in this case, the objective is to um, reproduce the past. So you want to find the evolution of your differential equation up to the, up certain point in the past that would explain what you saw in the past, okay? So here is an example of the output of our, of our code. So here we have a color code that tried to, to, to give uh, an idea of how close the society needs to be. So red would be, we need to be in a complete lockdown or something that looks like that and then we go to orange, which is less severe than the complete lockdown. And then we move up to a completely open society. And here, what we're trying to show is that you can either choose um, to do everything in a smooth way. So every region will start in a lockdown and then they will slowly open up, up to the point that they can um, live back in a new normal framework or you can actually try to enforce them to alternate between themselves. So if you see here, while this, this three series, they are completely co closed, three regions actually, not cities, are completely closed. If you have two regions, they are completely open. And then you, you can try to, by playing with parameters in the optimization problem, you can try to see if you can find different dynamics of the disease that would allow you to, to play a little bit with this kind of stuff. One of the nice things that we also did in this case where we have many regions is that uh, originally the state was saying that each region should take care of their own patients. So they, their patients should go to the ICU units of the region. And we actually show that if you try to enforce them in a very strict manner, you can actually have a region that have a very low capacity of, of ICU units. In this case, is the Southwest region in, in the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo that in order to control that region, you actually close another big region that have a very large capacity because they, they interconnect a lot because people from this region, they live close to Sao Paulo city and they go there to work. So in order to control the, 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 small, the small region, you actually have to close the large city, which is not a very good thing to do. And you actually show that once you decided to share the ICU units between those two regions, you actually improve the situation in both regions and they can actually control um, the, the disease together instead of each one trying to do their own stuff, okay? So this is something that we were actually able to do. And in some sense for some unknown region, that maybe they read our paper uh, just after the paper was written um, the state decided that they should share among the cities in the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo, for example. 
Another thing that we also did was um, to use the control variable that is the number of testing to show that if you actually choose wisely where you want to apply your test in every single day, you can actually have a better control of, um, of, the, of the spreading of the, of the dynamics of the disease. So this was published in, in PLOS one. The previous one was published in European Journal of Op Computation Optimization. And this, this, this one that talks about how to choose test wisely, we, we, we published it in, in PLOS one. And another thing that we did that we actually, I think is the best thing we did in some sense was to show that it can actually use this kind of ideas to answer questions like, under what conditions it is sensible to postpone the second dose of a two dose vaccination um, campaign? And what are the groups that you should actually vaccinate first? And how you do this? You actually compute optimal vaccination campaigns and you give to the code information about the vaccines. For example, what is the efficacy of the vaccine after the first dose? and what is the efficacy of the vaccine after the second dose. And you look at the output to see if the optimal vaccination campaign would naturally postpone the second dose, because for example, the efficacy is close one to the other. And actually you can, actually, you can really measure how long in the future you, you use the second, the, 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 the second dose. So this is what you see in this um, graph here. So here, we know that we knew we had the, the estimates, the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was the vaccine that was being used in Brazil at the moment. The most important vaccine that was being used in Brazil at the moment uh, was something like 82.5.4%. And we then, we, we assumed that the, the first dose efficacy was anything from 0% up to 82.4%. And then we ran the code and the code would create different um, vaccination campaigns. And what we would see is that the minimum amount of time between the dose was four weeks. The maximum amount of time between the dose was 12 weeks, okay? And we didn't say anything to the code, it would choose itself. So what we saw is that once the first dose efficacy was getting closer to 80%, the code itself would start choosing vaccination campaigns that would postpone the second dose up to the maximum, um, to the maximum possible time that you had, the maximum time window that you had, okay? And we actually also showed that that would also depend whether you're assuming that your vaccine is just decreasing the symptoms or it's actually blocking infection. So the, the decision to postpone the vaccine was much clearer in the case that the vaccines block infection than when they alleviate symptoms only. And as I said, how you do it, you do it by computing the vaccination campaign. So he, here is a vaccination campaign for a four age groups, okay? Uh, a line, a uh, uh, full line is for the first dose, a uh, dashed line is for the second dose. So how you know how, how long it's going to postpone the, the second dose? Just by looking at the profile. So here, what is basically saying is that you start giving vaccine to people which are 65 years or older, and you, you give the first dose and then you only give the second dose for those people in the first dose at the day 84, which is the 12 weeks. And then you start giving vaccines to people which are from 50 to 64. And you see that only after 84 weeks, you start giving the second dose that corresponds to that first dose and so on, okay? And we actually did some simulations like, and. What happens if your young people, they move around much, much more than the elder people. So they have a, a tendency of having a larger reproduction number. Would, would that make the vaccination campaign move towards giving vaccines to the younger people? And what we basically concluded is that that's not really the important thing here, which is, which is much more important is that people which are elder 
they go to, they need much more IC units than the people which are younger. So if you, you were, you're trying to control the IC units is, um, use, usage, you have to give um, your vaccines to the elder people. And that was actually completed by the code itself. It's not something that we tried to enforce why shows in the optimization problem. That was a natural result from the optimization process. And also by doing the simulation, we can actually estimate the number of people that would be spared for going to the ICU units uh, if you postpone the second dose for the real uh, estimated, not the real, for the estimated efficacy of the first dose, which was 70%, okay? So in this case, we, our code would say that we would save 40 ICU admissions per 100K habitants in a vaccination campaign that would last something like 200 days. Okay, this was for the alpha variant. For the delta was probably the reverse. You don't want to uh, postpone the first dose because in the delta, the efficacy of the first dose is much lower than 70%, is much closer to, I don't know, 30 or something like that. And the code itself was saying, in that case, you don't want to, to postpone the, the second dose. You, you want to do, give the second dose as soon as possible in four weeks, which is nice. So we wrote the paper and we sent the paper to a publication where in a situation where we only had the alpha variant. But since we did in the paper, um, the study assuming different possibilities for the first dose efficacy, the same result would also apply to the omic to, I don't know, to, to, the, to, the delta, to the delta variant, which would decrease a lot the efficacy of the first dose, okay? Um, so that's it, 30 minutes, not bad. Um, at the end of the day, those, those, this research has resulted in three papers. One was published uh, in AGCO, which is a more mathematical and computational paper, which it presents the model and how we did the code and things like that. And, and then we wrote two other papers, um, changing a little bit the model and adding the testing. That one was in, published in PLOS One, and the vaccine um, paper was published at the proceeding of the natural sciences and especially in medicine and things like that, okay? And we also have the code that we use it to do all the simulations um, publicly available. It's not the easiest code to use, but we are here to help anyone who, who wants to use it, okay? So I think that's it. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, Paulo. <clears throat> are there any questions uh, from the audience? Hello? Uh, yeah, hello? Can you hear me? Hello? I mean, I can hear you. Oh, all right. I, I can't hear Paulo. Is there any yeah, question right? from the audience? Yes, that's, that's the point. No. Yes, I, I don't have the, the chat here. So if there is a <laughs> question in the chat, I don't have it. Mm. Oh, are there, there's there no questions on the chat. Yeah. Hi, I'm enough. I, I can ask a question. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, hi, Paolo, it's Marcus here. Um, so yeah, interesting talk. Um, I, um, I'm, this might be a silly question because I think I missed a little bit um, at the start of your talk, but um, I guess I'm curious to know um, why you, or if you think it's also possible to approach this problem 
as as a control problem, right? I mean, you you sort of started by describing it as a control problem, but you end up treating it as a static mathematical optimization problem, or or um, yeah. So, is is it possible to to think about it from a control point of view, or even from the point of view of a um, dynamic optimization algorithm? Just curious to know your thoughts on that. Okay, so um, what we did, we treated it as a control problem, but to solve a control problem, you have to solve your differential equation in a computer. And in order to do that, you have to choose when you discretize. So since you are more from the optimization, the, the finite dimensional optimization group here, we decided to discretize from the beginning and treat the optimization problem. Why? Because um, the differential equation from the, the, this compartmental models, the, it is very well behaved. So a simple discretization, even with a long time step, like a full day, is already enough for you to get a very reasonable solution. So there is no reason for you to stay in the infinite dimensional framework and try to work there because you're not really gaining anything from that. So the difference equation is actually good enough in this case to get very reasonable results. So that was the reason. So it's basically, it's easier to, to treat it as a finite dimensional problem. And we have better tools to treat it as a finite dimensional problem. So we went for it. Anyhow, since we have many populations and subpopulations and subregions, and a very in order to do this kind of problem, because you have this um, end of the world scenario, that if you do it for a very short time span, the decision would basically be let everyone die in the last day. We had to do a very long, like one year, two year simulation, thing like that. The number of variables are already very large and considerable, like say, tens of thousands of variables and constraints and things like that. So it's already complex enough to do it in that, in that way. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Welcome. Are there any other questions? I don't see anyone's questions on the chat. So um, I guess then we can conclude this session. Um, can everyone please thank Paulo for his time? Um, it's a pleasure to have you um, with us and then um, best wishes from us. Okay, so thank you again for the invitation. It was yep. a pleasure to, to talk to you. Okay. Thanks. Bye.